should point out the slight irony that I realise I'm talking about digital and I've brought paper that I've written on by hand. Um, but so from the future over to the practical. So um, Anthony asked me to give you a very practical session today about Power Grade Pivot. Um, but before I do, I'm quite conscious that we've got kind of a mixed audience of people who are from the world of books and those of you who are from the world of journals. Um, so I thought what I'd do is I'd set the scene a little for you. So as a researcher in the humanities and social sciences, I traditionally had two routes as to where I can publish my research. I can either publish it as a journal article or I can publish it as a monograph. Now, a journal article is, say, on average, in the humanities and social sciences, say, about 8,000 words. And a monograph, for argument's sake, let's say that the average is about 80 to 90,000 words. Now, the reason that these publications are the lengths that they are are due to the historic, traditional restrictions imposed upon us by a print-based world. So the restrictions imposed upon us by traditional printers and binders, and even print-based business models and the cost of paper. And so what that has meant is that for decades and decades, there has been this desert-like expanse between the journal article and the monograph in terms of length. And it just seems so incredibly strange because it really would be a strange phenomenon if research was always naturally eight or 80,000 words. It's just simply not the case. And actually, researchers are producing research that falls somewhere in the middle. And until now, they've had to make a decision. They've either had to cut up their research into multiple journal articles, thus fragmenting their research, or they've had to pad it out into a full-length monograph, thus either delaying their research or diluting it. And in a digital world where ebooks are increasingly becoming a significant part of our business, it just seems crazy that we really only have just started to scratch the surface in terms of the opportunities that digital really does offer us and the scholarly community as a whole. So I wanted to share with you some research that we undertook at Palgrave. Um, so this started in 2011, and we put together a panel of researchers from across the humanities and social sciences um, around the world. Uh, unfortunately, it's slightly more skewed towards the UK and Europe, um, but we do have a good representation from elsewhere. And it's from researchers, um, so not students, academics themselves, but from a sort of a wide range of uh, levels of experience and uh, careers. And so we thought we'd just ask them what they thought about the monograph. Um, and you can see here that, uh, formatting's changed slightly there, but uh, you can see here that an awful lot of people think that monographs are about right, um, and 38% think they're a bit long. Um, and unsurprisingly, only 44% uh, sorry, think they're too short. Um, we also asked them about what they thought about journals. Um, about two thirds thought that they were about the right length, but again, in general, people thought they were too long. So with the mindset of this mid-form publication idea, which I know many publishers have been toying with for many years, but few have actually really done anything yet. So we thought, actually, let's, let's test this. So as part of the panel, we asked them what they thought about this idea of being able to publish something in the middle. Did you think it's a good idea? And you can see here that, in general, people thought it was quite a nice idea. Um, but I think it's, we all know that it's really easy to agree to an idea. So um, I know it's probably a good idea for me to go for a jog before dinner tonight, because I've heard that desserts are going to be good. Um, but the likelihood of me actually doing that is probably pretty slim. Um, and so with that in mind, we asked our researchers, if there was a format available for you to publish in this mid-form, would you? Um, and we were quite surprised by their um, very positive reactions. So 84% said that they would be quite or very likely to publish in this format. And the reasons that uh, the, uh, those that didn't think it was a good idea was mainly because they were worried about what their colleagues thought, or they were worried about how these mid-form publication formats would count in research assessment exercises, so the REF or tenure exercises, for instance. And I'll come on to those later. But for those who thought it was a good idea, and alongside this uh, quantitative research, we also conducted many interviews with researchers. And the reason that came out very strongly was they just wanted to be able to publish research at its natural length. And so mid-form publications, there's a variety of different publishers who have been playing with this for the last few years. So back in 2011 now, I think it was, Springer launched Springer Briefs, which publishes summaries of research. You've got uh, Princeton University Press with their Princeton Shorts. And they're publishing um, previously published content, but what they're doing is they're cherry picking the best and most influential chapters from previously published titles and packaging them together as short books. 
And in trade, we've probably all heard of Amazon's Kindle singles. And as I say, I know an awful lot of publishers um, have been thinking about these. And it's, I don't think it matters whether you think of it as mid-form publishing, as I do, or whether you think of them as short books or scholarly novellas or uh, the mini-graph, as uh, some people like to refer it to. But, you know, length really isn't the only restriction that exists and still kind of is there for us in this uh, supposedly e-focused world. So those of you from the world of journals, if we cast our mind backs now, it seems a long time ago since we were kind of restricted by publishing. We had to sit on some of our journal articles because we were really worried about issues and volumes, print containers. And so we were having to wait to publish articles in order for that issue to come round. Now, luckily, in the world of books, we haven't had that same sort of print restrictions in terms of business model. But for those of you from the world of journals, you may not be aware of an industry rule that exists in the world of books. And the industry rule says that uh, you have to give the um, industry six months' notice before you publish the book. Now, if you're a researcher with highly topical research, six months seems a jolly long time. If you're an early years academic wanting to get tenure, and in order to get tenure, you have to have published your research, but you've got to wait at least six months to publish your research, that just seems such a long time. And so increasingly, we're seeing e-focus publishers are just ignoring that rule book. They're just throwing it away and thinking, do you know what, that's from an age of print. If the research is ready now, why can't we get that out there quickly? And by ignoring this uh, rule book, we have this opportunity to help researchers have impact. So in the humanities and social sciences, like all other subject areas, we're really having to demonstrate the value of the humanities and social sciences. What are the benefits for society? And policymakers and the like have been frustrated for years and years now that researchers are not addressing the needs of our society today. And the reason is that because they're not publishing research when the policymakers need it. And so if we can publish research as quickly as possible in books as well as journals, then we offer the greater opportunities to close this, this gap and really topple the ivory tower of academics kind of being very separate and out of what society needs. So we conducted a, uh, another survey, this time this was in uh, May 2012, um, and we were asking um, how important it is for academics in terms of the speed of publication. Uh, you can see here, uh, for the vast majority of academics, it was uh, incredibly important. Um, um, and uh, just uh, one quote on the side, so as I said, alongside all this quantitative research, we've been conducting uh, workflow interviews with um, researchers. Um, and the humanities, uh, this came out really strongly, that they feel like they're left behind. I think sometimes science publishing, it's, it's very fast. It's chip paper tomorrow. You know, things are, new discoveries are being made. And sometimes it's harder for the humanities to really make sure that they are relevant. And as people focus on this idea of impact and the value that the humanities offer to society, it is increasingly important. And so I think they feel that they've been left behind, but there's a real opportunity there for them to really put out their research in a way that actually can be understood by society as well as the rest of academia. Um, so I thought actually I should tell you what Powergrade Pivot is. Um, so Powergrade Pivot is this mid-length format. It's about publishing research at lengths between the journal article and monograph. It's about giving our researchers choice. So actually, now our authors, we've got a publication output. Regardless of what the research is, if it's good research, we will have a place that you can put it with, um, with us. And so we broke this rule book. So we um, endeavor to publish any title within 12 weeks of acceptance. So that's after full peer review. And the idea and premise behind Powergrade Pivot is to give us the opportunity to really kind of shake off the fetters of print-based world and to really re-envisage what we're doing and use it as a tool for change for us internally, but also to really think of digital first. So the practicalities. So we uh, decided to be brave and gave ourselves um, 10 months to put together Powergrade Pivot and have 20 titles. Um, at that point, we'd uh, had the grand vision, but we hadn't actually worked out how we were going to do that. Um, so when we set ourselves the goal of publishing things within 12 weeks, um, we knew we should be able to do it. We just didn't know how we would actually do that. Um, so uh, it was quite fun, particularly during when we were putting all the la launch titles through production, we were still fine-tuning um, the process. But I think it kind of taught us many things, and uh, one of the things we did in order to make sure that we can publish these titles um, so quickly, um, and so far, touch wood, we have published all of them within 12 weeks, 
is by putting in some very simple things that actually if you're starting from scratch and you're, you don't have the legacy systems that we have in place, actually makes much more sense and clarity to what we're doing. So we have one publishing system globally. So we have editorial offices in multiple locations, but we have a single publishing process, a single route, single lot of suppliers to make it happen. We encourage our authors to deliver their index in advance. Indexes, no one likes creating them, but they are still a very useful discovery tool. And so we encourage them to, bring, uh, to put that to us as soon as possible. We introduce templated cover designs. No one likes the word template, but they are beautiful templates. Um, and there are over 100 of them for our authors to um, choose from. Um, and we uh, uh, put in place a production manager to run everything globally, to whip everything into shape. Um, and there certainly was a sort of a good amount of blood, sweat, and tears, and sort of good old elbow grease in there, particularly towards the end uh, when we were putting everything in. But I think what was interesting is because we were breaking the industry rule book, and for the first time we really were thinking the digital first for ebooks, we had to look at everything in the publishing process that we do, both internally in terms of our workflows and how departments work together, but also how what we do impacts on third party stakeholders. Um, I think of it a bit like when, you know, the sort of age-old analogy of taking apart the engine and trying to put it back together. But in this instance, you might introduce a new part, and actually it's absolutely okay if you've got part left over, uh, parts left over at the end. Because if you don't need them anymore, because in this digital world, some of the things that we've done in the print world don't make any sense anymore, that's absolutely fine. And it's about the set unsettling of the status quo made us really appreciate the differences and actually how all our departments work together. Some of the things we've been ticking along as an industry, things just happen. But actually, as soon as you change something, actually all sorts of things kind of fall out of place. Um, and we were trying to really future-proof. So we've set ourselves 12 weeks to publish these titles. But what if we publish things in a month? So some of our processes, so for example, our Biblio team, they send out data to the world, to the likes of Amazon, once a month. But what if we publish a title and we only know about it a couple of days in advance of the Biblio data going out. So it just misses that month's data. By the time the next month's data goes out, actually we might have published it. And therefore we might have published a title before the industry even knows about it. So we had to question and really think about what are the future, what is the future and what are the sort of possibilities that might come in this new way of thinking. So lessons learned. Um, change, I think, is going to be the theme of this conference. Um, so what we learned is authors love print. People love print books. Um, authors in particular of their own books particularly love print. Um, so even though we were pushing for this to be a digital first initiative, actually our authors, many of them were still holding on to it being a print product. And I think, um, while there seems to be a lot of excitement um, in academics about uh, Power Grow Pivot, I think, which I touched on earlier, one of the issues is that the academic structure is not always as progressive as we'd like. And so while we might be trying to be progressive ourselves, there are certain things that aren't so progressive. So for instance, the common question we get from our authors is, if I publish with Pivot, will it count towards my tenure application? And the short answer is, we think it should, because if it's good peer-reviewed research, why shouldn't it? But actually, the tenure process in particular is very traditional in that actually you have to produce so many journal articles in such and such a journals, or you might have to have such so many monographs with so many presses. And Power Grow Pivot is something different, so they haven't handled that. And if you were an early years academic and your career was on the line, would you take a gamble with something new and innovative, even if it might be the best place for your research? Um, some have, some are more cautious. Um, but there are other areas of academia which, uh, and the whole sort of academic stakeholder environment that um, are less conservative. So HEFKE, um, if you've read the guidelines as many times as I have, uh, you'll know that actually HEFKE don't mind what format you publish your research. So you can have an exhibit, you can have blogs, you can have anything you like, which is great. However, we also know that departments still impose very strict criteria on their academics. So what HEFKE say might be, yes, everything goes, but actually various departments might specify you do need to publish in such and such a journal or publish so many um, books, and that's what we want to put forward. Um, so I think we're at a time when people are trying different things, but not all of academia and not all of the academic um, ecosystem is quite um, hewed up quite yet. I say, change, change is hard. Um, 
Of course, any change could be hard, particularly when you're trying to do things um, quite quickly and trying to make sure that for our books publishing that we are thinking digital first um, is challenging. Um, I'm just going to share with you one small example. Um, it is a very small example, but I think it's uh, a good example of the sorts of things that I'm talking about. So a few weeks before we launched, um, I received the proofs for one of our titles. Um, and I was excitedly scrolling through, um, having a little look. Um, and I came up across a page that said this. This page deliberately left blank. Now, there are so many ebooks out there that all of us have that have pages exactly like this. And this is because ebooks are currently the sort of afterthought of print. And in the print world, we obsess about rectos and versos, right hand pages and left hand pages. So chapters always start on the right-hand page. So if the previous chapter finished on the previous right-hand page, you've got a blank left-hand page, which is why you have a legacy of this page deliberately left blank. And why I think this is a, probably a good example is that I think throughout everything that we do in book publishing, even when e-books are such a significant part of our revenue streams these days, and we think that we're thinking about e-books all the time, there's all of these legacy print parts, small things that are in our existing processes. And yes, some of them are really small, but actually all of these small things combined really could be stopping us as an industry from innovating. So Pivot one year on, so we're fast approaching our first anniversary for Palgrave Pivot. We've published over 100 titles. We've published our fastest in just five weeks. Uh, that was particularly blood, sweat, and tears, um, but it was good. Uh, we, are, on average, we're seeing that our titles are coming out at 130 pages. Um, we'd actually predicted there'd probably be an average of 100 pages. Um, so it's uh, people still like to write. Um, and earlier in the year, we introduced an open access model, a gold open access model under a CCBY license. Um, we haven't published any under a CCBY license um, yet, um, but I'm sure you'll hear from Karen about um, open access in the humanities and social sciences in a moment. And I think in terms of uh, sort of tying in with what Hugh is talking about and actually the future of ebooks is actually I think it's all about us putting the research first. I think in the print world, you can tell the difference between a journal and a book. They look different, they feel different, they're a different number of pages, they sit on different shelves in the library. But given that it's all research, I think we do need to start to question in terms of whether these labels of books and journals are really necessary in an e-world. And we're already starting to see the blurring of boundaries. Some of these have been going on for some time, some um, much newer. So um, I've just highlighted Oxford Scholarship Online here. So their ebooks for quite some time have been in HTML, which just means that their ebooks actually look an awful lot like their journals. And we're starting to see new types of content. What is the content? So Nature Publishing Group are launching scientific data. And for that, the data is the content itself. And researchers are increasingly experimenting with disseminating their research in new ways. Many of them have blogs or engage with blog networks. They're engaging with multimedia uh, content because they want to reach beyond academia. They want to disseminate their research in faster, new, and novel ways. I think ebooks really do have the potential to better serve the needs of researchers. And as an industry, we need to ex ensure that we are fully exploiting the opportunity of ebooks, not just seeing them as a, sort of a byproduct um, to the print. And by doing so, we'll be able to fully meet the needs of our authors and readers as their tastes evolve over time. Thank you.